sometimes you want to have a positive impact on your blood glucose or you want to have a positive impact on insulin levels. You want to improve insulin resistance and you know that fiber is good, but you're like, this isn't a time where I'm just going to have a bunch of asparagus or this isn't a time where I'm going to have a bunch of artichokes. And like, I can't mix fiber with this meal. I think it, it's been you know, drilled into us enough by now that we know that fiber is positive when it comes down to blood glucose. But there's one specific kind of fiber that doesn't fall into the typical fiber category that if you ask me, it's probably the best fiber when it comes down to insulin resistance. So let's go ahead and jump into this. I also put a link down below for a company that makes a C15 for people that don't eat a lot of cheese or people that wanna get those C15 levels up. A lot of their research was funded by the United States Navy. They have some really interesting stuff. It's a company called Fatty15. I've talked to Dr. Van Watson multiple times, and I've even interviewed her on this channel. She is who really is one of the people that kind of started discovering this deficiency in dolphins. But this is something that's been talked about across the literature for a long time, but only recently has become sort of household information. I put a link down below for you to try Fatty15 if it's something that's of interest to you. I think it's a very important compound. It is a form of saturated fat. So it's not like we're talking anything really weird here. It's a saturated fat that we would get from good quality cheeses, but the amount of cheese you'd have to eat to get our levels back up, and again, this is a real deficiency, would be a lot of cheese. So that link is down below. It's a 15% off discount link, top line of the description underneath this video. I highly encourage you to at least go there and read some of the literature. It's fascinating. So there's a paper published in the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Took a look at subjects that consumed white bread and yogurt for breakfast. They divided them into two groups. Both still ate their white bread and yogurt. One group had muesli with three grams of beta-glucan fiber. We'll get to that in a second, what that means. The other group had four grams of beta-glucan fiber. You wanna know what's wild about this particular study? It was healthy individuals, and three grams of beta-glucans did not affect their blood glucose at all. Nothing positive, nothing negative. Four grams of beta-glucans had a tremendous impact on blood glucose. Now it tells us two things. It tells us one, that the dose matters with these things called beta-glucans. We'll expand more on what they are and where you can find them. Okay? But the other thing that's interesting is because this was a healthy population, with a healthy population, it's really difficult to get the needle to move because things are already functioning the way that they should. So like throwing a variable in there might not impact it as much. But there was another study that we're gonna to have to drill into that took a look at unhealthy people. And this is where the impact was really made. Now, I'm not insinuating that you're unhealthy. By unhealthy, I just mean this people are probably overweight, obese, insulin resistant. And whether you are far on that spectrum or mildly on that spectrum, it's something to be aware of. Now, beta-glucans, you're gonna find literally in things like mushrooms. It's what makes mushrooms slimy. If you ever leave them in the fridge, for too long, they get this weird like gelatinous layer around them. Okay, seaweed. Seaweed doesn't even show fiber on the label. Like if you get seaweed snacks, there's no fiber. It says zero grams of fiber. Okay, but they have a high amount of beta-glucans. Now beta-glucans, there are 250,000 glucose molecules bound together okay, with these bonds that humans lack the ability to break down. So in essence, it's a technical carbohydrate that doesn't get registered as a carbohydrate because it can't get broken down by enzymes in the human body, but it can get broken down by the gut. So it ferments and affects the gut tremendously, tremendously, okay? And this is why it can impact glucose so much, okay? Now, let's take a look at this paper that was talking about unhealthy people. So this study took a look at people that consumed four grams, six grams, or 8.4 grams of beta-glucans daily. Okay, they found pretty interesting results. They found in a dose-dependent fashion, the beta-glucans tremendously affected glucose. Okay, but they also found in a dose-dependent fashion that there was a 59 to 67% decrease in the amount of insulin that was released. So basically, it was making the body more sensitive to insulin. This is tremendous. Now, I'm gonna stop right here for a second because I wanna talk about ways that you can get beta-glucans, okay? And then I'm gonna come back into the science because not everyone has a bunch of time. So let's kind of get to this. Seaweed snacks are a phenomenal way to do it, okay? Then we also have things like, of course, we talked about mushrooms, okay? All different kinds of mushrooms, okay? Then we also have things like oats. Now, I usually recommend going with gluten-free oats, heating them, and then letting them cool overnight. 
Now, I do that because then I don't get the same glycemic response. It's not like eating something super high glycemic. So I'm getting a resistant starch attribute plus the beta-glucans. Now, what was interesting that four grams of beta-glucans led to a 38% less glucose spike. Six grams led to a 42% less spike. And 8.4 grams led to a 67% decrease in glucose spike. So definitely a dose-dependent fashion, but you see it's, it's not like an even linear thing. It was like the difference between three grams and four grams was like a negligible impact on glucose, like or a decent impact, but between each other was negligible. And then all of a sudden you went up to 8.4 grams and it was like, whoo. So definitely one of these things where the dose makes the poison, in this case, the dose makes the medicine. In this case, it's really important to say, hey, I'm gonna go for a higher amount of this if you are someone that is unhealthy. Now, you could poke holes in this and say that someone that is insulin resistant or someone that is unhealthy shouldn't have carbs at all. Like maybe they should restrict them, things like, well, that is the perfect candidate for someone that should maybe heat the oatmeal and then cool it down. Okay, you can also get it from rye, from sorghum, from some forms of wheat, but I just don't want to condone more consumption of wheat. We consume so much wheat, rye, barley, just naturally in life. I just don't feel comfortable condoning more of that. So I usually lean into like the kelp, the algae, the mushrooms, the more fringe things that you could easily add with minimal carbohydrate impact. Okay, so like it's not hard to add mushrooms to your eggs. It's not hard to just munch on a packet of seaweed if you like this stuff, okay? It's not hard to have like a quarter cup of cooled oats and you're gonna get this tremendous impact that even though you might have a negligible spike from the oatmeal, the long-term effect on the microbiome and affecting insulin resistance is phenomenal. I and mean, we're talking the 67% less spike in insulin after having carbohydrates when beta-glucans are in the mix. That is huge. So it goes down as my favorite fiber for insulin resistance.